Now, HR details, the right now, the only one that's FDA approved is the Myriad Genetics. Of course, the other guys are very closely following up. The many clinical trials are happening. Uh, so one in two patients, this is mainly for ovarian cancer. One in two patients are HRD positive. So this is proven. This data is proven uh, from the multiple trials. And one in four HRD positive patients also have a BRCA mutation. So this, this thing, these things come together. They are not like in isolation. They all come together. It's all one big happy family of mutations, you know. So of the ovarian cancer patients who are HRD positive, 15% is somatic and 10% is germline. So somatic are the newly acquired mutations during your lifetime. And germline mutations are the ones you inherit from your uh, parents, from your mother and father. Uh, so now there is a lot of push because many of the FDA approved tests look only at the somatic mutations. They don't typically include germline mutations. Now, even Myriad is submitting a lot of uh, addendums. They're coming up with a newer version of the exact same test, uh, including the germline testing. So germline testing, there's a lot of push. In the recent ASCO, almost every, everybody's talking about, man, why are we not doing germline testing? Traditionally, germline testing was done for uh, only one thing, like hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. It was not done for patients who are already confirmed cancer, who are already in the hospital going through treatment. It is only offered as a, as a career screening kind of thing for the relatives or first relatives. If the mother had cancer, then they do the BRCA testing for the for the younger for the daughters uh, or the first degree relatives. But it was not offered to the actual cancer patient themselves. So now the trend is we should also do look at germline mutations even for a known confirmed case because germline mutations do have a huge impact on the on the HRR this kind of DNA repair enzyme pathways, right? And the innovation that Myriad Genetics has done, they came up with these three biomarkers and they kind of named it. Let's see, I, 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 if I come up with a new biomarker and I say, this is Rajnikanth's biomarker, right? Then, then it becomes a standard. <laughs> right? I can name it whatever I want. <laughs> so that's what this, this case did. They said LOH, but LOH is actually a very common terminology in genetics. So it's so, so if you know the, the, the human genome or any animal genome is heterozygous. That means you have like a, a mother and father, right? So you have two, two copies of, from each. You have a heterozygosity. Uh, so what happens is because of this uh, end joining repair problem, uh, homologous reconstruction, failure of this HRR pathway, what happens is when it makes a copy, since it copies the exact same uh, from the maternal allele and paternal allele, they, the heterozygosity is lost. Now it becomes a homozygous, right? So this is not a medical genetics thing. In, we typically talk about homozygous or heterozygous when we talk about children with rare diseases uh, like sickle cell anemia, thalassemia, and those kind of things. And then we talk about Mendelian and non-Mendelian. And then we talk about pedigree and all those things. Right? So the, the zygosity matters in this in rare diseases and medical genetics. But now that is also coming into, into oncology now. So now the, here the zygosity is only on those certain regions, not on, not on the entire, entire genome, it's only in those certain regions, problematic areas, where the damage has happened. And in that area, all the copies of the DNA are exactly the same. That means there is no, there's no heterozygosity. So this, this phenomena is called loss of heterozygosity. Uh, people use this terminology very often, but they don't understand what it is. Uh, so once, once you dig deeper into, the, into what is really happening behind the scenes, uh, then you'll understand. As a closely related biomarker is the telomeric allelic imbalance. We don't say zygosity. So it's exact same thing. Only difference is instead of happening in the middle of the genome, it's happening at the tail end of the genome in the telomeres. <laughs> you know, the chromosome is made up of the short on P and Q, and they have centromere in the middle, telomeres at the end. And the telomeres are very important for cancer because of the immortality. So they have the, the lot of mutations in the telomerase gene. Uh, they keep extending the telomere. Otherwise, what happens? The cancer replicates so fast. If they don't keep extending the telomere, there will be a lethality and the cells will die. Uh, because of that, when it makes copies and keeps extending the telomere, there's an allelic imbalance. So on one side, you have like six alleles. On the other side, you have like 12 alleles or like 3x or 5x. It's this is basically a copy number. <clears throat> well, we typically say copy number for the single nucleotides. <clears throat> this is copy number at a large scale. Right, very big, very big, uh, you know, like more than 50 bases long. Sometimes it's like 100 KB, right? 100,000 bases or 10,000 bases. One complete stretch uh, is like multiplied two, three times, just like gene fusions. We don't say gene fusions in telomere because it's non-coding area. So this is where myriad cases became very, very creative. They say 
telomeric allelic imbalance, <laughs> right? So they came up with this nice terminology. So now it has become like a, a done and dusted terminology. So now everybody has to follow this. I cannot call it something else. Now I also, even if I develop a test, I have to say L-O-H-T-A-I and L-S-T. I have to stick to that because if I change the name, nobody will understand, you know? That's the, that's the problem with this uh, naming con conventions. Then the third biomarker, again, a very closely related biomarker is the large scale state transitions. The traditional name for that is structural variations. Uh, these are like an entire chunk of DNA missing in one place and appearing in another place are completely gone. We don't know what we, we don't know what happened to the chunk of DNA. So this is typically what we do traditionally. We do a final repeat test, very low cost test called karyotyping. <laughs> Again, in in medical genetics, in the in the children and the rare diseases, right? Karyotyping. So this is basically karyotyping uh, with the new technologies like bio genomics, which is basically a chromosome paint and stuff. So here you're looking at. Uh, a, a large chunk of DNA, chromosome, entire chromosome, not, not just small DNA, entire chromosome, an entire chunk of DNA is missing in one place or it's appearing in another place, all those kind of things. Typically, we call them as uh, translocations and those kind of things, inversions, which happens in, in, the, in the medical genetics cases. But here, this is happening in cancer and it's not happening in the coding region, it's happening in the non-coding region. That's why they have to come up with all these new terminologies, right? Uh, so now what what is the outcome of this <clears throat> if you if you you have they have to go with this kind of um, uh, risk risk scoring algorithm right they are actually using some kind of um, uh, machine learning artificial intelligence software behind the scenes uh, they have not they never published how would they come up with a score so they came up with this concept of uh, genomic stability <clears throat> genomic stability score gss or genomic instability whatever you want to call it uh, genomic instability scoring mechanism. So these are the three main biomarkers they use. So they also take into account the BRCA mutations. And most recently, they have included the promoter methylation. So why is the promoter methylation? Many people don't know this. Uh, I, I hear a lot of my doctor friends, oncologists, keep asking me, promoter methylation is very important. Said, Sir, why? <laughs> David doesn't know. <laughs> Let me explain why. Every gene has something called the promoter in the upstream, right? So the promoter is going to be the main one. That's where the transcription factor binds. And then the gene is turned on. Then the DNA becomes RNA, RNA becomes protein. Now, normally when you look at gain of, in genetics is everything boils down to two things. Either it's a gain of function or a loss of function. So gain of function can happen because of a very strong promoter uh, and multiple copies of the same gene keep on expressing. There's an overexpression. That's, that could be one reason. But in cancer, the most common is a copy number changes because of all these uh, structural variations and multiple gene fusions and stuff. The same gene gets duplicated multiple times. And in reality, the human genome has a lot of pseudo genes, right? So many genes which are not used at all. There's so many genes which are just lying around vacant, doing nothing. And then that's where the methylation comes very important. It's an epigenetic regulation. Uh, so media genetics was the first to promote that and other companies have followed suit. So the promoter is very important. You, so uh, long story short, methylation is one of the mechanisms of how to regulate the DNA uh, to either turn on and off switch mechanism. Uh, typically, it's not, all the, it all, it's not always the case. Typically, if the DNA is methylated, it is silenced. If the, if the methylation is removed, then it is switched on. So methylation is a mechanism of silencing the function of that particular stretch of DNA. So the promoter region, if it is methylated, you're basically switching it off, right? Which will have the exact same effect of a mutations. So in the mutation situation, the promoter is perfectly normal. The protein is expressed, but the protein is a mutated version of the protein and it doesn't work properly. There's a loss of function. But in promoter methylation, the BRCA gene can be a wild type. So significance of promoter methylation is when you do a regular BRCA test, if you have not done this kind of HRD or HR test, if you go for just a regular BRCA1 and 2 test and just look for mutations, everything comes as wild type. Then the doctor will say, yeah, this is BRCA wild type. This patient does not qualify for the treatment. I'll go for something else. I'll go for a chemotherapy or hormone therapy or whatever is as per the guidelines. Uh, so this patient may not qualify for PARP inhibitor therapy because the BRCA test is wild type. But then did you check the promoter methylation? Because the promoter methylation is going to silence the gene even if there are no mutations in the, in the coding portion of the gene. That's why the promoter methylation is very important. And now we are realizing beyond genetics, 
the epigenetics has a huge role, especially in oncology. We don't know about other areas, also maybe in neurology, but in oncology epigenetics, so if, you, if you see the next 10 years, almost every test that we are doing, we have to include some kind of epigenetic biomarkers and methylation, promoter methylation, not just for BRCA mutations, for a whole bunch of genes. This is a universal mechanism. We have to check the promoters. This is what we realized. Okay, if this is happening in the BRCA situation, then what about NTRK? What about all the other? Even if we see a gene fusion, if the promoter is methylated, the gene fusion is not going to work. It's a loss of function, right? So I don't have to worry about the gene fusion if there's upstream promoter methylation. So the promoter methylation completely, it's like a spinny, you know, like a, a curveball, <laughs> completely turn, twisting the story. You know, the, the last minute of the climax of the movie, you have a twist, you know, the, the plot twist, something like that. So that's, that's the key in this uh, particular test. <laughs> And uh, these are some of the companies. <clears throat> so let me move this down. These are some of the companies who, who are basically in, in the US, but we are, we are seeing the similar, a lot of companies popping up in, the, in India and other Singapore, other places also. Uh, number one, obviously, Myriad, MyChoice, CDX. Uh, then we have Caris, Molecular Intelligence. Uh, India also, can, we can also order, order this test through Lalpath. And the foundation, again, Roche is promoting foundation in India. And Tempest is a close competitor to Foundation, but they have not been typically part of the trials. Uh, so Myriad has been part of the Paola trial, Prima trial, and the Solo trial. Foundation has been part of the Solo and Aerial trials. <laughs> right? And that's Myriad, Myriad and Foundation are already part of the guidelines, as per guidelines. Myriad is also in NCCN guidelines, whereas the other guys are not in the guidelines. And I, I think Myriad and Foundation both have FDA approved. And there's one more, one more company not in this table also very close to getting FDA approval very soon. So if you look at the biomarkers, you'll see the, the variations, right? So in Myriad Mycha CDX, they are looking at the, the BRCA, uh, the tumor BRCA mutations, right? The T stands for tumor. Then they look at the LOH, TA, and LST. Uh, CARIS does the BRCA mutations, and they come up with a different concept called percentage LOH, right? Uh, percentage of loss of heterozygosity. That is an indirect mathematical model based on, so what CARIS does is they do a whole genome sequencing. And from that, they come up with some, some uh, artificial method, just like how you do like in thyroid, you measure T3, T4, TSH, and then you, you don't know what is the free, free version versus the bound version. If you know one, then there's a formula to calculate the other one, right? So like that, the percentage LOH, is not the real LOH, so it's a, it's a it's a pseudo biomarker, right? So that's what Myriad's main marketing push is. We are looking at twenty seven thousand SNPs across the genome, important parts, whereas these caries guys are only doing percentage LOH. They're only looking at thirty five thousand SNPs, so it's a thirty thousand versus thirty three thousand, like what, almost ten times. So Myriad's coverage is ten times more than caries. After seeing this, I said. Man, I am covering the whole genome. <laughs> That's 3 billion bases. <laughs> You're only looking at 30,000 bases. I'm covering the whole genome, 3 billion bases. So I, that means we should also do the same marketing pitch and say, we are bigger than Myriad. <laughs> we'll do that eventually, you know. So also they include the, <clears throat> the large rearrangement, LST, <clears throat> which is unique to Myriad, which nobody has done it so far because it's too much expensive to do this kind of test in the, in the Illumina kind of platforms. Uh, because it needs more coverage and more breadth of coverage and depth of coverage. And because these are long reads, uh, doing it in a short read platform is again very challenging. And because it's a non-coding region, you'll have a lot of repeat regions, you know, like yeah, 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 like that, T, 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 like that, right? So G, 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 like that. So C, G, G, C, G, like that. So if you have repeat regions, and I'm only doing 150 to 300 basis short reads, how am I going to assemble it, right? The, the reference genome is not, is not perfect. Uh, not only we are using a lot, uh, the Nanapur community has been very active with uh, with the telomere to telomere project, and we are keep on refining the human reference genome. You know. So even though Myriad says I am the only guy who can do this large state transitions, that's not true. A uh, lot of other companies can also do it, but they are not doing it for a simple reason: it's too expensive. Right? That's the only reason. Uh, so, so this is the uh, this is a compa this comparison. This can be a bigger table. But this just I took it from uh, that one of those uh, publications. Uh, but there's a lot of advantages in Myriad because uh, it's part of the guidelines, it's part of it's part of the clinical trials and so many things. But it's very expensive, and we cannot order from India. I don't know if I don't know who is the distributor for Myriad in India. I've been talking to many people, 
uh, I, I don't think there's any distributor for Myriad in India. You know, that's, that's the challenge. But foundation is available in India. Caris is available in India. Tempest is not available in India. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <clears> HR <throat> gene panel. So HR gene mutations panel, what are the genes? So like I said, BRCA1 and 2, obviously the, the very first ones. So here you can see, remember the LA Raja concept I, thought, I was talking about. Uh, imagine BRCA1 and 2 is the LA Raja. So what happens like, you see all these complex interactions, so many proteins, right? Everybody have to come uh, to do this one simple task of preparing the DNA. Uh, so the most common ones are the ATM, so ATM was discovered in a disease called ataxia, uh, telangiectasia mutated. Then it's BRIP1, PALB2. PALB2, even before HRR panel became popular, a uh, lot of companies, including AstraZeneca, they're actually promoting PALB2. Don't just do BRCA2, also do PALB2. But now we are realizing it's not just one, just not just adding PALB2, now you have to add a whole bunch of other things. So if you are if you are cash trapped, if you want to develop a low cost solution, a more affordable solution, especially for India, uh, this is the minimum gene list, right? So I can see like uh, three, six, nine, 12, 13, 14, around 15, less than 15 genes, right? Uh, so this is the this is the perfect, these are the most important uh, rate limiting steps. And here you can see the RAD 51C, 51B, D, and 54L, all these are part of the same complex. Uh, similarly, you can see the fan CL, which is basically was found in Fanconi anemia. Uh, there's a complex of proteins called Fanconi anemia complex. And then you have the barred one, check two, check one, check two. They, they are coming in the cell cycle checkpoints. Uh, the cell cycle checkpoint is very important because if in order to do a DNA repair, so Im imagine I'm, I'm driving and suddenly I have a flat tire, right? How can I fix it? I'm driving, I'm moving, right? I have to stop the vehicle. I have to get out of the vehicle, then only I can change the tire, right? So that's exactly what's happening in here also, right? So in order to fix the DNA damage, I have to stop the cell from replicating. That's why the cell cycle checkpoint is very important. Is check one, check two important? Yes, they are important, but um, are they rate limiting? I don't think so. Uh, they'll be rate limiting in the second step, but they're not rate limiting in the first step, right? So they are, they're important in the second half of the story, they are not important in the first half of the story, right? So, so that 51C complex comes first, then Fanconi anemia complex, then you have that cell cycle checkpoint. So checkpoints are important because you have to stop the cell from replicating so that you give enough time to the cell for the DNA repair machinery, right? That's the whole idea. Mm -hmm.